some 602 repentant Boko Haram members have denounced their membership of the group and sworn oath of allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria. The ex-insurgents who have completed a de-radicalization, rehabilitation and reintegration program denounced their membership of the insurgent group at the Malam City Camp in Kwame local government area of Gombe State. Reports indicate that they denounced their membership of Boko Haram before an 11-man Kwasi judicial panel headed by Justice Nehizena Afolabi of the Federal High Court in Gombe. Speaking during the exercise, the coordinator operation safe corridor, Major General Bamidele Shafa, said after the oath taken, if there are if after the oath taken, if the insurgents commit any offense, they stand to forfeit all privileges they have acquired and will be liable to have committed an offense against the state. Joining us live is security expert Kabir Adamu from Abuja to have a conversation on this and others. Good to have you, Mr. Adamu. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Again, still on security matters, over 600 repentant, uh, repentant Boko Haram members on Monday renounced their membership of the group and swore an oath of allegiance to the federal government of Nigeria before the 11-member uh, Kwasi judicial panel. Now, Kabir, you would agree that this is not the first time this is in the news. Are these numbers an indication that this strategy is working? What is new? Um, frankly, nothing. Um, the the only I think new development is that there is a you know swearing of an oath of allegiance, but Operation Safe Corridor, which is what this um, whole process of deradicalization is called in Nigeria, uh, has been ongoing for the past um, since 2014 under uh, former President Goodluck Jonathan's administration. Um, of course, when President Buhari administration came in, he changed. Um, the strategy a bit. Uh, we saw an overwhelming influence of the military in, in, in the strategy, on, unlike under President Goodluck Jonathan, when it was headed by, by civilian under the Office of the National Security Advisor. But the process is the same. Uh, some component of, um, you know, arrested and either uh, confessed Boko Haram members are put through Operation Safe Corridor, where they have an attempt to de-radicalize them, teach them uh, vocational skills, uh, you know, use ideological means to change their mindset, and then they are relieved. But um, like I said, the only new development is this oath of allegiance, and mm -hmm. um, we're not sure how much uh, this oath of allegiance would change the entire outcome of the process. Yeah, uh, because that brings now. me to my next question, actually. I, I want us to talk about this oath taken. Why is it uh, relevant? And does it really work in enhancing recommitment to the nation? Is it enough, you know, for them to take an oath and that is it? Well, we're hoping so. An oath is an oath. And, but then it is only effective to the extent that you are able to review and ensure that um, the person who takes the oath understand um, what uh, the significance of that oath is. And then, of course, how he or she commits to that, that oath. If, we, if, we don't, if you don't have a means of either managing or influencing how the outcome of that oath, then frankly, it's as good as, as, as nothing. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that there will be some form of um, surveillance that will be put on this 600 plus persons that have taken that oath to ensure that they are living up to the commitments, um, you know, sworn under that oath. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what led to, you know, this new development of introducing the swearing of an oath. Is there uh, anything that you know about that? We're aware that there are a lot of criticisms had followed um, Operation Safe Corridor. Uh, some the perspective is that these are, you know, um, terrorists who have one or the other associated themselves with terrorist group, and that um, releasing them into the open society is as good as uh, allowing them to rejoin the, the terrorist groups. So I think it's that kind of um, you know criticisms that led to further checks, including this um, oath taking mm -hmm. measures. Um, but frankly, my position and my perspective is that oaths are only as effective as um, the, what kind of surveillance measures you put on he who takes that, that oath, and whether the person actually believes in whatever it is uh, that you made him or her swear, swear mm -hmm. to in terms of the oath he took. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's a very crucial point you've made there, the belief uh, aspect. Now, the former insurgents are said to have completed a de-radicalization and rehabilitation as well as reintegration uh, program. What would this entail? And again, how effective are such trainings? Um, as far as we know, there are several uh, government departments, ministries, departments, and agencies that are involved in the de-radicalization process. That is Operation Safe Corridor. It is an institution um, managed by experts, uh, theoretically, that is. In terms of the operational uh, composition of Operation Safe Corridor, the whole process has been a bit opaque, and for understandable reasons. These are former terrorists. Um, their active members would like to get hold of them. We're aware that during some of the negotiation processes, uh, they have the, 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 these groups have actually demanded for the release of these former members. So clearly, uh, the institution is under uh, a lot of protection, and so that, that's why it's not a bit difficult to understand the operational component. But in terms of the theoretical un underpinnings of the Operation Safe Corridor, we're aware that several government organizations are involved from um, academic experts to theological experts to vocational um, acquisition skill experts to um, psycho psychologists, um, even sports. Um, all, of, all of these are involved. The whole idea is to put um, an individual through a process where his mindset, uh, a radicalized mindset, is reversed into uh, a functional member of the society. Um, I'm aware that several reviews have been conducted by the Buhari administration with a view to enhancing the efficacy of the program itself. But like I said, it's quite confidential. And at this stage, I think I would leave it by saying that mm -hmm. the process itself, in terms of running the institution, it's a functional and effective um, theoretical method. The operations, unfortunately, is a bit difficult for us to um, go into. But okay. we know that the theoretical underpinnings are uh, effective and functional. All right. I mean, if you like, uh, Kabir, you can say that these ex or repentant insurgents are both insiders and outsiders. Uh, I mean, insiders because they were in, in the group uh, and outsiders because they are out of it. Now, in what ways can these repentant insurgents be used in such a way that they do not jeopardize the ongoing war against insurgency in the country? Um, very, very key question. Um, I, I, would, I would hope, and I, I want to emphasize this word, I would hope that the security architecture uh, in Nigeria would have taken advantage of this group of persons where they are debriefed um, so that an understanding of the functional aspects of the especially two or three major terrorist groups in Nigeria is understood. I'm talking of, about the Jamaat al al and al dawati al jihad as well as the Islamic State in West Africa province. Now, if you have former members, it means you have at your disposal a, um, a, a veritable tool with which to understand the operations of that group. So a debriefing process where all of these members are brought on board and then, you know, several aspects of interrogation as well as the debriefing itself, which all of these are very key security instruments. And I'm hoping that both the military as well as the civilian intelligence um, departments in Nigeria, in this regard, I'm talking of the Department of Intelligence, um, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Intelligence Agency, the, 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 the State Security Service, and the, all the components of the military intelligence units, so the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, I would put this, um, you know, former members of um, these two groups that I mentioned into both the debriefing and the interrogation process, so that the, a grand picture of the operation of the operations of these two key terrorist groups is understood. Mm -hmm. If that is done, then um, we would have taken advantage of these members. Unfortunately, if that is not done, then we have missed on a. On, on an opportunity. And the fact that we have not yet arrested or even killed the leadership of uh, the two groups that I mentioned means, unfortunately, we are not doing that effectively or even efficiently. Mm -hmm. I mean, before I let you go, are there issues to deal with stigma? I mean, when these people are brought back to their communities, and if they be, how is that handled? 
Yes, uh, stigmatization is a key uh, function, and um, we, we can use the example of especially the women that have been um, rescued, or some of them who have escaped from this, the two major groups that the Jamaat al Alsin al Dawat al Jihad and the Islamic State in West Africa province. We know that some of these women have, have faced stigmatization to the extent that some of them even prefer to go back to the groups them, themselves. Um, now, to that extent, uh, this particular group of former uh, de-radicalized Boko Haram members would definitely face um, st um, stigmatization. And you, we have to remember that one of the issues under uh, discussion currently is the criticisms, uh, you know, being leveled at, at the Buhari administration, where some members of society feel that they are giving more attention to this uh, de-radicalized or arrested or, you know, detained um, former members of Boko Haram than the victims of the insurgency itself, even though that is, I think, a, a misconceived perception. Uh, however, it is uh, a, a very key element of the criticism space in that. So stigmatization is real, and I think more effort is required by both the government as well as several members of the society, including the media and civil society organizations, to reduce this component of um, stigmatization. If at all these, me these uh, members, these 602 uh, ex-insurgents are going to be integrated into society. Mm -hmm. I mean, the conversation around security is one that we continue to be ongoing. Uh, you are aware of the army redeploying some generals. Does that have anything? What would that do again, you know, for the fight against insurgency? Does it add anything? Or what's your thoughts on that? Um, uh, uh, rotations within security organizations, especially the military, is uh, periodic. Um, when it's done uh, strategically, by that I mean factors such as competence, um, effectiveness, efficiency, and merit are put uh, into consideration when this deployment, uh, redeployment takes place then um, it, is, it, it, is, it is good. It, it would be help uh, the counterinsurgency operations. However, if other factors, um, you know, beyond what I've just mentioned, are the reasons for the redeployment, then unfortunately um, it would not help uh, the counterinsurgency situation. Um, we are aware that there is a lot of, um, you know, under, on, underlying uh, factors uh, regarding the welfare equipment uh, capabilities and several other uh, aspects regarding the counter insurgency operations um, in the northeast of Nigeria and other parts of um, the country where the military is involved. Um, so at this stage, I think um, the military itself is undergoing a lot of factors. You recall not too long ago, the um, commander of Operation Lafia Doli, um, Ad General Adini, released a video where he mentioned a lot of things, including deficit in intelligence, deficit of equipment, and several other factors regarding the welfare of the military. Um, so this type of deployment, I think it's, it's good, but only if it's done strategically and it would help uh, the, the operational objectives of the military in Nigeria. Kabir Adamu, uh, security expert, thank you so very much for your time with us this morning and for bringing in new perspective to the conversation as always. Do keep safe out there.